Can everybody hear us? Hello. Hey, everyone. Let me just change it to us. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, Aaron here from Learn Squared HQ, and we're joined with Tyler Smith. Um, thank you for joining us this morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, please let us know before we begin if you guys a, can see us, can hear us, or can't. And then we'll get that sorted out. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But until then, just give you a quick rundown of what we'll be doing today. Um, so as you guys are probably aware, Tyler's brand new Learn Squared course is out, VFX in Unreal. Um, and Tyler wanted to basically give us a quick demonstration of the course and some of the cool things you can do in there, especially with how he builds the special effects using a, the new advanced tools such as Niagara. And um, it's going to be interesting to see how everybody takes this on board because I'm sure many of you here um, are probably working in Unreal Engine already um, or are considering it. And then some of us are probably not, we are not even considering it at all, or probably still thinking or on the fence of what it could be. So this would be a quite cool demonstration of um, the power of this engine. But um, before I hand it over to Tyler, um, if you have any questions throughout, please pop it in the chat. We'll probably do a Q&A at the end, but obviously if there's any questions that we can jump in whilst Tyler's demonstrating um, this live stream, then we'll do that as well. Um, and also we'll announce the winners of our giveaway, um, which ended this morning, um, whoever will walk away. So three winners will be walking away with um, VFX and Unreal. So we'll announce that at the end of the stream as well. Um, so yeah, I think we're good to go. And again, like I said, if you see any technical difficulties or can't hear us, just let me know and we'll get that sorted out. Um, but yeah, before we begin, Tyler, um, I'll hand it over to yourself. And if you want to just give everybody a nice warm welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to show everybody kind of what I've been cooking up for just this demo to showcase uh, some of the elements that you'll be seeing in the course and everything like that. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, Aaron, if you're cool with it, I'll share my screen and I can show you what I've been working on. Yeah, cool. I'll just quickly yeah. get that sorted out. Yeah, let me do that. So yeah, what I have here um, is I was thinking kind of what ideas I could have for something for this live stream here. And what I wanted to take was start with some of the tech that we had for the uh, rain and water chapter of the course, which is the waterfall. Uh, that's one of the elements so we had rain, we had um, pouring streams of water, we had water splashes and everything. And uh, one of the elements was having an actual sort of waterfall sort of pooling over the rocks. And what I wanted to go with that is if you take that same tech and apply it to something like mist coming out of a cauldron or something like that, that's kind of what I wanted to roll with, uh, with here. So, uh, you can see right here, what I had was, okay, how do we take that same effect of just using the panning texture, um, material setup that we have and how can we apply that to, uh, something other than water, something like mist or blowing smoke or something like that. So, uh, what I have right here is uh, a couple different examples. One is, uh, two different meshes that can sort of demo how, uh, panning, these panning sort of mist textures can flow over a surface coming out of the cauldron shape I have here. And then I have a simple cascade effect that shows um, an element that can animate kind of a mesh over time. So you can see these like drops are sort of like sort of going up and then they're dropping back down and then there's this small uh, mesh that's kind of left behind. So I wanted to kind of animate how we can switch between uh, different stages of a sort of water or drop shapes life with um, animating different particle meshes based on when one particle dies, you spawn another particle. And then at the end here, um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to copy that cascade effect, uh, make it a Niagara effect, and then uh, show some of the power that Niagara has under the hood by uh, adding this other effect with this kind of like nice swirling sort of uh, uh, sort of group of balls and uh, these spheres here that are kind of just sort of swirling out of the cauldron shape here. So uh, that's kind of what we have in store for today. And uh, we'll be just, I'll just be kind of going through and breaking down uh, some of the different elements that make this. So I'll go ahead and start here. Um, uh, just really quick, uh, let me open this menu. Let me do this quick here, uh, just so I can... Give me one second. Okay. 
So yeah, what I want to first start off with is uh, this material right here that's uh, causing the uh, mesh or the uh, sort of cloudy meshes to flow over this uh, cauldron as it's coming out of the cauldron here. So let me see here. Um, it's a little bit hard to see in this demo here. So let me see if I can set the defaults where it's a little bit. And uh, I'll just kind of start from uh, sort of the beginning here and see what I can show you here. So you can see a little bit is going on right there. So yeah, we can start from there. So what I have is uh, just this very, very basic texture. This comes with uh, a default UB4 package. It's just um, T underscore soft smoke. Um, and you can really use any texture that you want. Um, what's really cool is you can make your own textures, obviously. You can uh, make them in Substance Designer, ZBrush. Uh, you can even just draw them in Photoshop. Um, but this is just sort of a base uh, cloudy texture that comes default with every UB4 package that I just wanted to plug into um, this uh, panner setup that I have here. So what well, you can see what I have here, and I'll just kind of... Uh, start from the beginning here and just do a uh, right click and start pe uh, start preview mode here. Then I'm going to start uh, pull up a panner node. Or I should say this is a um, texture node right here that's just holding this um, basic uh, tiling cloud texture that's set up here. And then I have this uh, what's called a panner node in the UE for uh, material setup when I plug this in here. And uh, I did I just did a uh, simple right click and um, preview node here. So, uh, and I can uh, stop that right here. So this uh, stops it. So you can see the default um, rendering of the material as it goes all the way through all these links to the final um, material node here. But if I want to isolate a, a single thing and see what it's doing, I can just click this part of the node chain, uh, right click, start preview, uh, start preview node. And uh, I can just see what this texture is doing right here in the space here, which is really nice. Um, when I uh, go into this panner here, and I uh, look here, I see speed X and speed Y. Uh, this is saying we want to take this tiling texture and want to uh, pan it across either the uh, X or the Y. So you can do uh, something like, if I do something like 1, you can see now that it's panning up. If I do negative 1, I can have it pan down. Back at 0, I can have uh, the same thing apply from left to right. And what's really cool is that if I do uh, both of these, um, we can get sort of a mix up where it's going diagonally or uh, going all these uh, different which ways, which adds a lot of um, really cool factors here to the uh, to the panning texture here. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to set this uh, at zero. So it's just going up and down. Uh, I'm going to look here, see if I did a negative value. Yeah, I did a negative value here. And then I do something that's a little bit lower, like negative 0.5. Um, so what I have here is I have two of these. And what is going on here is I have um, two different speeds of the pattern node here. So negative 0.25 and I have negative 0.5 here. Um, and another thing that's set up here is um, I have these um, parameters in the material here, which is uh, tile X and tile Y. And what I can do here is I'll go ahead and copy this and paste this here and plug this into the coordinates of the panner. Um, sorry to jump in, Tyler. Yeah, no no problem. Um, I don't think my butterfingers click go live on the stream, so if you wouldn't mind uh, starting again. Uh, no problem, yeah. Um, so if anyone who's just jumped in right now, do apologize, I forgot to make the stream go live. We could see on our end, but obviously not on yours. Um, so just let me know in the chat if you can still see us or can see everything now. Um, Tyler's only been just started for about five minutes ago. Um, so yeah, Tyler, if you want to just get going, um, um, that'd be great. And I apologize, everybody. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, do you have a, a YouTube link to the chat so I can see? Yeah, the I'll send chat? that. I'll send that to you now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So let's. Um, yeah, I'll start from the beginning here. Um, so what I have set up here is uh, sort of the demo I wanted to put together for the uh, live stream that we're setting up this morning. Uh, and so what it is, is that I looked at chapter two with the uh, waterfalls that we had in chapter two of the course, where we have a uh, water sort of flowing over meshes that we've created. Uh, and I want to take that and kind of jump off of that where it's like, okay, we have water. What if we apply that to something like um, pooling mist or clouds coming out of like, say, a cauldron or a... Uh, uh, something like that, like sort of a bubbling cauldron effect. 
Uh, so I wanted to take that and sort of run with the panning texture that we set up in the course and see how we can push that to create another element like smoke or mist or sort of that dry ice effect uh, that I think looks pretty cool. So I got uh, two versions of that. I got these uh, two meshes that I have set up and I will um, go into Maya and this can be used in Blender or uh, 3ds Max or just any modeling package that you want. But um, I, I got Maya set up on my machine on my side. So I'll uh, go ahead and show how I got these two effects have uh, set, that I have set up here. Um, and then I have uh, this effect that showcases like these sort of drops coming out of the cauldron um, and then going back down and leaving these sort of smaller drops sort of hanging in the air before they come back down a little bit more. Um, and so how I wanted to do that was I wanted to sh show sort of a pipeline of... Hold on, let me click this YouTube link here so I can see everybody. Okay, yeah, I think we got this set to go here. Yeah, let me just take a second here. I can see uh, what everyone's typing here. Um, yeah, uh, Aaron, if you want, I can uh, go ahead and answer some of these questions uh, yeah, right now. Just uh, some basic like uh, uh, elements. Like, do you need to know kind of the basic layout of the engines? Um, yeah, please yeah, go ahead. That'd be great. Yeah, for sure. I'll... Um, so uh, for the first question, do we need basic knowledge of the engine? I would say, yeah. Um, I'm going to be going through all the terminology as I lay it down as best as I can, um, saying like this is a single scalar parameter. Like I, I try with every um, action I do in the course, I try to uh, speak like this is what I'm doing or this is the button I'm hitting. Um, but like a basic, basic layout of um, like this is a material. This is what basic material links do. Um, this is what a uh, texture does. This is what... Um, uh, and luckily, um, there's a ton of resources for that just on Epic's uh, YouTube channel. Um, there's tons and tons of tutorials on like, hey, and they're pretty short. It, so I'd say like to get a basic understanding of UE4 uh, or UE5 and understand like, okay, this is the um, sort of basic fundamentals of how the engine works. Um, that You could probably do that in a day or two and uh, then come back. And again, I'll be um, making sure that for every action that I do, I'm... Uh, acknowledge or that every action that I did in the course, I was making sure that it's like, Hey, this is the button I'm hitting. This is the uh, node that's being generated. Um, this is what's linking into. So there's no mystery as far as like what actions were done and uh, be sure to um, uh, message too. If there's anything that's missed, I'd be more than happy to go in and be like, Oh, sorry, I missed that. Here's, you know, what's uh link. Uh, this is what I was doing. This is the name of it and everything. Um, at the end of the course, will we be able to make a little show reel? Uh, absolutely. That's um another, uh, uh, chapter that we have in there too is like how once you have this effect how are you able to capture the video of this effect and present it in a cool way that you can put on your instagram your tiktok your art station things like that so that's definitely covered um uh hi there from uh italy uh yeah um i can english is totally good yeah it's good to good to meet you um let's see here yeah, the art skills. Um, so the uh, technical understanding of UE4 and also the artistic readout, we're definitely covering that too in the course where, um, yeah, understanding what makes an appealing uh, visual effect. Um, that's definitely covered um, extensively in the course where it's like, yes, knowing the technical side of how to do all this is very important, but also understanding like what makes good looking water, fire, air, that is definitely covered as well. Um, let's see here. Yeah, let's see here. I think I think that's everything as of now. So I can jump back in here and show you kind of what I was doing with uh, this material. So uh, both of these effects right here are working with the same material, and they just have a material instance set up. So what I've got set up here, and I'll um, kind of restart this really quick here. I'll kind of zoom out and show you. This is the material that's powering um, this uh, sort of panning cloud effect that's going through here. And so what I have is, um, this is a little bit complicated, but I'll go ahead and break these down here. So I'm going to go ahead and categorize this as the color that's being plugged in. So I have two things. I have both the base color and the emissive color. Uh, the emissive color is just sort of the glow uh, that's happening with the panning clouds. So that can be categorized there. Um, I have the opacity, which I'll go ahead and I'm going to move these a little bit so they're a little bit easier to see. Thank you. 
So the opacity, what's um, sort of showing through? So uh, this is actually, and I can uh, show you the actual mesh that this is um, running on. So uh, actually, this is not a particle effect so much as this is a mesh that has a material applied to it with these textures panning over it. Uh, and what you see here, this sort of like torus shape that I made here in Maya, um, this is what the texture is panning over. And so you can see it's obviously really solid. So um, what we have here is a mask that's panning over the texture, or panning over the mesh, I should say. And uh, this is the node link up that's saying, hey, we want everything to be kind of in this black and white mask, and that's going into the opacity here. Um, then we have what's actually making sort of the this look very 3D. So that's how we're getting all this like really nice uh, form to these clouds. That's not just these flat textures sort of panning over um, just a flat uh, shape. We have this really cool, like, you know, uh, 3D sort of depth to these cloud shapes as they come out of the cauldron, which looks really, really cool. And uh, how that's being done is um, with the uh, world displacement and uh, tessellation of the mesh. Uh, and that's just, uh, we're taking the opacity mask and we're just plugging it into this very simple, like, okay, we want to multiply this by height. We want to multiply this by the vertex normal. And we just want to put this into the world displacement. And so, starting back here, kind of most of the... Um, uh, complicated uh, node setup, or not really complicated, but most of the node setup here is set up in the uh, panning of these two textures over each other. So I just have this very simple um, uh, soft smoke uh, tiling cloud texture. This comes with UE4. Um, it's kind of a sort of public domain sort of basic cloud texture. Um, and you can use any texture, obviously, that you want if you want to do this. Um, we cover that a lot in the course where it's uh, texture creation and tiling textures and making sure that you know you have a basic setup where, you know, if you want to hand paint or design your own textures in Substance Designer or ZBrush or anything like that, um, you can have that be sort of the basis of your own personal style. And then it's just is plugged into this material pipeline where um, it'll go through the panning, but your shapes are going to show through and your own unique, you know, sense of style is going to come through here. Um, so by default here, I just have this sort of public domain basic tiling smoke texture. Um, I have a panner that's going into it that's making it pan um, up and down. Um, this is a little bit hard to see here um, just because it has sort of a bright background. I think I might be able to change this, but I'm not going to fiddle around too much uh, as of right now. Um, so we just have um, these slots here, which is uh, these two panning textures that are panning along the Y speed, which is up and down. And then, um, sorry, I just wanted to pause to check the chat really quick there. Uh, yes, we do cover blood effects in the, um, that's the last chapter before Niagara. Um, that was a really fun chapter where, yeah, we want to get that sense of um, that blood spray. So not only uh, the blood spraying out, but if it strikes a surface, we want to have that nice sort of like splat, you know, as it hits a flat surface, kind of like... Um, when I was working uh, on Ghost of Tsushima, that was one of the coolest effects that I loved seeing all the time was um, when the blood leaves the, you know, when the person is hit with the sword and the blood sprays out, it would land on the, um, you'd have, you know, these little droplets land on the ground and you'd have where like you'd have these streaks that sort of skid across the surface. So we definitely cover that. Um, so you can definitely uh, have that effect. Um, we have a whole chapter that covers that in the course, which is really cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for all the kind words, everybody. I really, really appreciate that. Let's see. Yeah, let me see. As far as UV projection, um, I would say probably the easiest way to go back, if you're talking about a large scene with a lot of props and every prop needs to be UV'd um, separately, probably the easiest way to... Um, Probably the easiest way to fix that would be um, UVing your uh, meshes before you populate the scene uh, would probably be the easiest way to do that. Um, and that seems like going back to square one, and that is uh, a little bit frustrating, but it does go a lot uh, quicker. And I always catch myself a lot with that, too, where it's like um, you uh, kind of have your scene that you have you have like your props that you're going to assemble in the scene and you uv them before you populate or before you um you know duplicate those objects and place them all over um would probably be the easiest way to do that um let me see here yeah so going back to this uh panning texture here so uh, i'll go ahead and do this where um 
So if you want to isolate anything uh, in a material uh, node chain uh, before it's going in here, you're seeing the final results here, which is a little bit hard to see what's going on. But um, if you want to, say, see something like, I just want to see what's going on here, you just need this. Uh, right click and go start previewing node. And when you hit that, it's going to just uh, sort of stop and isolate it right here. And you can see what's going on just in this part of the node chain. So you can see that this panner effect is uh, panning this uh, tiling cloud texture just up and down like this. Uh, and then if I go a little bit further and I preview this one, which is multiplying the values of these two textures here. Uh, so you can see a little bit more dynamic movement is going on right here where um, I have these two textures. They're panning at a different value. You can see here, so 0.25 and 0.5. And then um, when I have them multiplying their dark values over each other, um, you can see that that's a little bit more interesting what's going on there. And when I uh, plug that into this uh, contrast node here, so if I preview this, you can see with this extra layer, I can have a little bit of uh, extra uh, power that I have here. So you can see that this um, is really bright now, but if I turn this into something like a value of three, you can see that we're getting a little bit more um, of a nice sort of faded effect here. I'll put this back at point 0.1 for now. Um, if I then add um, this right here, which is, let's see here. Let me put this contrast back at point, uh, back at three. What I was doing here is I just did the uh, this texture coordinates note, which, um, and for all of these, I'm just doing like, you can just search uh, here and uh, type in texture coordinate um, or any of these here. So uh, uh, something like component mask, uh, that's what this one is called. Uh, so material expression component mask, I can just uh, right click component. So you just search by kind of Google search technique, which is really nice. Um, so what I'm doing here is when I mask um, the green channel, so the texture coordinate has two gradients. Um, it has a red gradient and a green gradient. So there's a so when you see this kind of weird sort of like uh, green to red to yellow, uh, what that is is it's um, two gradients, uh, one in the red channel that's going uh, this way, and one in the green that's, if I actually know, the red is going up or down this way, and the green is going left to right this way. If I just want to uh, isolate one of those channels, I'll just do a component mask and just say mask the green channel. And then if I want to uh, do a power node, which is like the levels node in Photoshop, I can go ahead and uh, get that so this gradient's more isolated here. And then I can um, invert this channel and then uh, have the same applied here. So when I add those all together, I get this, I get a kind of black uh, screen here, but... Um, there should be just like a beam going through here. And I just set this up with uh, notes here, but you can just do this in Photoshop if you just wanted to just do a soft sort of like uh, beam that's going through the uh, texture space here if you really wanted to. Yeah, I, that that is really tough. Uh, UE4 on Linux, um, that I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I have uh, only worked on PC and... That uh, that is tough. I'm very sorry. I don't I don't have an answer for you for using uh, UE4 on Linux, but um, hopefully uh, with with the support um, on the end for Linux users, um, maybe UE4 can. Uh, uh, there can be some uh, help with trying to get that to work. Um, but yeah, that's tough. I'm uh, I'm sorry. There's probably not a lot of support for uh, UE4 Linux work, but I uh, my sympathies going forward. Um, so when all that is set up here and I set this uh, subtract node uh, by 0.5, um, and this is uh, getting a little bit hard to demo. Let me try again, uh, put this back at 0.1 and maybe we'll get a bit of a, there we go. There we go. So you can see now that um, with this uh, subtract node, which is subtracting values by 0.5, you can see we have these sort of values sort of passing over this uh, plane here that you can see. And so what's really cool about that, and if I hit this one here before the subtract, you can see that um, we have these sort of nice gray values all kind of panning over each other. And um, this can be a lot more complicated. I notice right now there's a little bit of a visual bug where we get that little bit of overlap where they're all kind of like syncing. Those two textures are syncing a little bit. So what I might do here is um, I might do a very low value in the speed X, like 0.1. And that'll help a little bit with getting it, or actually I might do 0 0.01. Go even lower there. And so, yeah, that gets it. So the overlap isn't quite as um, uh, visual or quite as uh, 
evident as uh, seeing before. So uh, once this is all set up, I'm then just plugging this into the height and the vertex normal here. Uh, and then I just uh, am turning on tessellation. Now, an important thing for UE5 users, uh, anyone using UE5 out there that I found out, they're not uh, having this option in materials anymore. Tessellation is being taken out of UE5 for materials. Uh, what they want you to do instead is um, with your mesh, uh, you subdivide it to a pretty high um, uh, rate, like you know 30,000 or 40,000 uh, tries. Use Nanite to bring it in if you want. Um, and then you just plug this into the world displacement. So if you're in UE5 wanting to uh, recreate this, um, you would just have to take this node chain right here and plug it into world position offset. And then um, you don't need to worry about these two right here because they don't exist anymore. But uh, for now, uh, I'm using this in uh, 4.27. So uh, this is kind of how I'm using it uh, as of right now. Uh, the last thing I'm doing is uh, plugging it into a depth fade here. Uh, which will um, have it fade if it's uh, interacting with any uh, solid surface, which is really nice, so we don't get the clipping effect. Uh, and when this is all applied, at the end, we're getting... Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and save it. Why not? Let it do its thing really quick here. Or maybe I shouldn't have... Shoot. Uh, let's see here. Let me put this back at... Point three, and see if that changes it up. And we put this at point zero. And let me change this back to exactly how it was before, just in case. There we go. Okay, everything's back to normal. Um, so then uh, the big factor is, okay, we have this sort of pooling out... Um, along this mesh, how are we getting this to like swirl around in this uh, circular shape? That's actually a really, really easy um, factor that we can do. So uh, seeing this right here, and I also have the uh, UV set up here. You can see that you can see that they are uh, panning perfectly in this UV space here. They're actually clipping down a little bit uh, past here, but that's okay because the texture is tiling perfectly um, going across this UV space here. Um, I have the UVs uh, at the top here. They're being set at the dead center of this uh, shape here. And then the bottom uh, UVs that are set up here are at the uh, outer space right here. So all I'm doing for creating that swirling effect is I'll just go ahead and create this. I'm just using a uh, twist deformer. Uh, so, uh, and I know that uh, this exists in Blender as well, um, where I just am doing uh, deform, nonlinear twist. Let me move this really quick here. And then I'm just going to do a start angle, move this. Let me see if I can have this uh, selected here. Actually, let me do this so we can see the um, uh, topology a little bit more and what it's doing. So um, when I do this twist angle and uh, I say, hey, I want the start angle to do this, and I want the end angle to go the other way, you can see that this topology is twisting a little bit, that these um, vertices are uh or sorry, these uh, polygons are twisting a little bit, but the UVs are staying exactly the same. The UVs haven't changed. So when I then um, export this, um, it's thinking of it like a, a roller coaster track or a train track where the um, texture is panning down these straight tracks, but we're taking the track and bending it and twisting it a little bit. So um, the textures will kind of go along for that ride. So when I export it and bring it into here, that's how we get this effect where the textures are sort of twisting. And you can also twist this um, not just in Z space, but sort of have it go either way. You can just do all kinds of cool things if you sort of bend and twist your um, geometry and have the texture span over it like that. And so that's how I'm getting this effect here. Um, moving on to... And uh, as far as the light, I just have a very simple point light set up in each of these cauldrons, one orange and one green. Uh, and let me go ahead and select this right here. Uh, and what I had set up for this is a uh, sort of fundamental cascade effect um, that we can start with and then move on to Niagara with that. And what this is is that I have three um, particle emitters set up in here. Um, I have this uh, first mesh that is, uh, and I can show this in Maya what I have, is that I wanted to sort of simulate the um, lifespan of sort of a drop sort of going up 
and then falling back down and leaving sort of that secondary drop uh, once the gravity separates the two uh, and have it uh, fall a little bit uh, slower so you can have that cool effect. So let me go ahead and show this here, what I got. Uh, so what I have here is I have um, the beginning of the particle's life, which is uh, this drop that will um, go up. Uh, let me showcase here. Uh, okay, there we go. I was just checking the feed to make sure that you were seeing uh, that it wasn't just showing you before and you weren't able to see Maya, but it looks like we're good. Uh, so I have the beginning of the particle's life here, which um, is this mesh right here. I have the second sort of phase of what's going to happen in this, uh, like, drops life or particles life, which is uh, this uh, simple uh, oval shape right here, which is at the top. And then I have this one, which is a little bit of an altered um, version of the body of drop uh, that will go ahead and go back down uh, at a faster rate, leave this uh, to drop a little bit slower. So what you're kind of seeing here is sort of the lifespan of what this drop is going to do broken down into three meshes here. Um, you can do this with a lot of other water drop effects um, if you wanted to. The thing that's really important is that you need to make sure that we're going to have this next particle spawn when the first particle dies. So you need to make sure that the origin um, is at the exact same for all of these and that the relative shape is um, the exact same as well. So you can see that uh, this first one, uh, I have the origin set down here for the second drop, even though it's way up here, the uh, origin is uh, down at the exact same spot. And uh, the same goes for um, this one right here. So then when I go back into Cascade, um, and I just have a very simple uh, orange uh, material uh, applied to this where that's being driven by the uh, particles color. Uh, so what I have is um, I have this first uh, shape that's being generated here. I'm doing a size by life um, graph that's being represented here. Uh, you can go ahead and see this uh, uh, being represented in the graph here. And then in Cascade, I kind of like just... Uh, uh, working with these numbers here. So uh, at the beginning of the particle's life, uh, which is represented at zero, I have a uh, value of this mesh or a scale of this mesh at um, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.1. Um, so it's very, very small. And let me go ahead and show this. Um, what I can do here is under time, I can do animation speed. I can turn this down to like 5%. So it's going in super slow-mo. Uh, so you can see that like first the mesh is sort of uh, um, sort of coming into uh, its scale there, and then it's growing. It's sort of uh, going, it's scaling in Z, so it's growing up like that. Uh, so by the time it hits um, its lifetime, it's at 1, 1, 1. But for, um, from 0.1 to 1, it's at a scale of 1, 1, and 0. Uh, so you can see it like uh, is a flat like a pancake, and then it grows up... Um, so it doesn't just pop into existence. That's another uh, nice thing, too, is you kind of want um, the beginning of your particle's lifetime, if it's a mesh, uh, to usually start at a very, very low value or just a value of zero. And so then what I'm doing, uh, once that's uh, generated, is I want to create this event generator that says, hey, uh, when this particle dies, I want to do something. I want to generate this event. So um, I give it a custom name. I say start, uh, give it the particle's death. And then uh, with the second one here, which is going to be the drop shape, I'm going to do a event receiver spawn. And then I'm going to say, hey, I want the uh, event generator to be death of uh, that event name, which is start, which is when you go back here. Uh, it's the same name. So it says, hey, when this particle dies, I want to populate this particle uh, where the last one was. So you can see now that um, when this particle dies, um, that last drop is being um, generated right where uh, it is. But uh, that looks a little bit jarring because this one is just sort of popping out of existence when uh, it dies. So I need to have uh, a second one um, that is that uh, meshes uh, sort of the drop's body so that when it goes back down, um, I'm just essentially doing a scale by life, a scale by life, which um, will have it sort of do the inverted effect, where it's going to go back down and then shrink. Um, so you can see here, like in slow mo, what's happening is that. So it's populating, and then you can see that this is going back down, and the drop is sort of following like that, and have where sort of the drop uh, separates, uh, disappears, and you get this really kind of cool effect uh, just based out of these three uh, particles here. And so that is sort of the basis of how I have this set up here. Um, and that's uh, Cascade. So what would be really cool is if you get that into Niagara, what else can you do? So I'm going to open up this Niagara effect really quick here.
And this is where it gets really fun because you can see just um, Power of Niagara, which is this really, really cool effect here. So I want to just um, sort of duplicate uh, the same thing in Niagara that I had set up in Cascade. And uh, that's pretty easy. We just have to know a little bit of different terminology. So um, we have to uh, just find that. And so instead of a um, vent generator, um, we just have to search something called generate death event, uh, which is... Um, What's really nice about Niagara too is just like the material editor, you can just right click and uh, type in the naming convention and it'll pull up um, anything that is related to the word that you typed in Google search style. So that's really cool. So uh, with this first one here, I'm generating the death event. Uh, with this second one here, which is the uh, drop, I just need to uh, send, hey, we have a event handler uh, for the spawn particles. We want to spawn a certain amount uh, based off this event and we want to receive the death event, which is going to excuse me, which is going to um, come off of the event that was generated in this first one here. And instead of having to type in the name, we just need to uh, pull down from here and uh, we'll have all the events that are generated. So instead of having to type in the name and make sure it matches, uh, we just need to uh, uh, pull down from this menu here and it's good to go. Uh, and then we want to say how many we want to spawn for each particle that dies. And we'll just say um, we want to generate uh, one per particle, uh, or the old one that's going to die. Let me go ahead and turn some of these off here so we can see this isolated a little bit more. And so you can see the same is being uh, generated here. And I just did the same thing too, where um, you know I initialized the particle. So the menu is a little bit different where we have, okay, what's the um, initial excuse me, initializing or the particle that um, once it's uh, spawned in the world, what do we want to apply to it? And then want to, what do we want to happen to it after the particle is spawned? So um, the initializing is, bef is essentially getting everything ready for the particle before it is spawned in the world. And then um, the particle update is, okay, what's going to happen once the particle is spawned in the world? And so with that, um, I just have basic... Um, scale mesh, the mesh color, everything like that, what the mesh scale is going to be. And then uh, all I have under particle update is um, I want to scale the mesh size, which is what we did before. Um, so with starting in Cascade, what I wanted to do was um, for the beginning of the lessons, emphasizing um, that the textures and the materials, um, there's a couple of different reasons why I wanted to start in Cascade. One was um, uh, with uh, the timing of the course, once I was making the course, um, I wasn't quite sure because um, Niagara is getting updated pretty much like every couple months. It's still very, very new and very exciting. So it was the case of like, do we want to, when we're establishing the fundamentals of VFX work, uh, real-time VFX work, um, do we want to use a very, very tried and true system that... Um, there's really not a lot of mystery left to it because it's been used for so long uh, that we can focus on texture, the material layout uh, of the effects generation. That was one big thing is that most of the lessons actually focus on the material uh, layout and the um, how to uh, do the texture pipeline and the material pipeline. And then uh, Cascade is kind of the final vehicle for um, portraying what your material and texture work is going to be. Um, and also, too, a couple other reasons. One was to um, Niagara... If anyone uh, had uh, any hardware issues or anything like that, Cascade and older versions of UE4 can run um, a lot easier. Like even I have a pretty old machine and Niagara sometimes chugs a little bit on my end. So um, that is one reason too. Uh, but just having where the fundamentals are understood in uh, Cascade and then moving on to Niagara in the later lessons um, was kind of the decision we wanted to go with. Um, that, was, that was one of the... Um, uh, and also... The other question, what module slow down the PC the most in Cascade? I, I would say um, two things can really tank it. One is a really high spawn rate. Um, and another one is um, a long lifespan, uh, particularly if your particles are living forever and there's a really large um, spawn rate that you have. Those particles are going to spawn and then they're not going to die. And so your CPU and GPU have to... Um, uh, you have the, your PC has to take into accommodation all those particles, and eventually the CPU and GPU will just kind of give up and uh, crash UE4 or even crash your PC. So, uh, spawn rate is definitely something you want to uh, always be conscientious of when you're working in. Uh, um, I would say Cascade, the industry standard for now. Um, it's hard to say. Um, just from my personal experience. Um, 
a lot of IPs being made um, by uh, studios. They would either have their own system that they've implemented with their own engine or their own version of the particle systems they have set up. Um, I would say uh, Niagara is probably going to be the industry standard in a year or two. And definitely if you're doing portfolio work and you're saying, hey, I'm using Niagara. But if the effects look good enough, I don't think it would... um, be anything against your uh if you make the effects look really good it um doesn't really matter if you made it in cascade or niagara uh the fundamentals are all the same the velocity math vec- or the uh, vector math the uh terminology the um understanding of a particle's lifetime and optimization and everything um it um if the effect looks good it's not really going to matter uh, now niagara has a ton of um tools and optimization and really amazing features that it has. So you can um, do really, really cool um, new features with your effects that couldn't be done in Cascade. So that is definitely a reason to want to pursue Niagara. Um, But I would say like if you made the effect in Cascade and you put it as a portfolio piece and it um, is looking really good as a portfolio piece, it uh, is still going to get you noticed. Uh, Most definitely uh, from my experience working with um, art directors and VFX artists and things like that. Um, So going into really quickly here, um, this would just be the new um, layout of um, the graph uh, versus Cascade. So we have this really nice graph here that has a way better interface in Niagara. Um, So you can, uh, you know, do things like this. We can get, you know, we can get that kind of nice sort of squash and stretch going on with ease in and ease out uh, with what's going on there, which looks really nice. Um, I'll go ahead and turn this uh, third one back on here that you're seeing. So we can see the whole lifetime here. And so, yeah, what's uh, really important is you just want to make sure um, with doing this that um, everything is uh, at a scale of one um, at the end of the particle's life uh, when it hits the value of one. Um, So that when you have the second and third meshes spawning, when this first particle dies, um, there's no weird popping or anything like that. Like it's just this kind of nice seamless um, going from one particle to the other that you can see here. Uh, And then at the end here, what I really wanted to showcase was just like some of the features that Niagara has, which is really cool, which is um, I wanted to do a vortex velocity. I just have this very simple sphere mesh, this uh, magic sphere that comes with the course. Um, And then I just wanted to apply a a vortex velocity and a curl noise force, which uh, are these two really cool new features that come with Niagara. Um, Curl noise is definitely the like meat and potatoes, like cool factor of moving, moving, uh, particles around, which is really, really cool. Um, and this vortex velocity is what's making it sort of spin around this, uh, axis here once it's spawned, which is really cool. Um, the other thing that I'm doing too, is I'm having, um, these, uh, vortex balls spawn, um, when the first particle dies here and, um, they are spawning at the origin point of where that particle is dying. So you can get these nice uh, sort of swirl effects that you're seeing with the, with the um, spheres here as they move around the axis. And then uh, you can see a bunch of uh, really cool factors here. So let me go ahead and start from the beginning here where um, I have this like default uh, setup here, um, which would be like, hey, we just want, you know, sort of a default factor here which it looks nice but it's um a little bit noisy so i wanted to do was i want to just do where we can add a little bit more complexity to this which is like hey you know i want to do some of these particles get like no influence from the velocity of this vortex and some get a ton so i'm just gonna type in random range float so it'll say um when the particle is spawned um it's either going to get uh no influence from this or it's going to get uh excuse me a ton of influence from it so when I set that up, you can see that it that creates this really cool shape where some of these particles are sort of dragging or moving slowly and not moving, and some are really going along for the ride. So just a little bit of math uh, implementation like that can really, this really cool new effect, um, which is uh, really cool to see. Uh, and what's really amazing, too, is that I have this vortex going, and you can mix and match. Um, so if I turn off the curl noise really quick here. You can see that these particles are moving in kind of this unison way. But if I um, turn on this curl noise, it'll add a little bit of extra, like, um, interesting force to it. And I did the same thing with the curl noise here, where it's like, hey, on some of these, I want to have a minimum or a value of 150 as the minimum and a value of 200. Or we could even do something crazy like 500 as the maximum. And so you can see, like, yeah, we'll have some 
really sort of interesting effects going on with these balls as they're kind of swirling around here. Um, I'm also scaling the mesh size so that um, they don't pop in and out of existence. I'm saying, hey, at the beginning of the particle's life, it's at zero. It'll go up to a scale of one, um, and then it'll go back down to a scale of zero as uh, the particle gets to the end of its lifetime. That way you can get this sort of nice, like it'll grow and then it'll shrink along its life so you don't get this kind of weird fade in or fade out or pop in and out with uh, these meshes here. And I can go ahead and do sort of a ease in and ease out here. Actually, go ahead and control that there. And so, yeah, with um, this setup here that you can see, um, that's kind of the demo that I wanted to showcase of what's in store for the course. And uh, we can go ahead and uh, include this um, uh, scene that you're seeing here in the live stream as well um, and package it for the course once you uh, once you get it. You can see some of these are clipping on the outside of it. So I'm going to go in and uh, just make this uh, sphere location that I have just a little bit smaller. I'm going to do something like 90 instead of 120. Just so all those uh, drops are staying in the cauldron there. I'm going to go ahead and move that down. And so you can see with that, um, we can get this really cool uh, just effect with just a couple different effects and these um, different uh, penning textures on these meshes here. So that is... Yes, that is true. Um, this is uh, going at 60 frames per second on my end. And uh, yeah, it's a little... Sorry about the stream. It's uh, lagging just a little bit. But um, let me go ahead and... Uh, hit. You can just see kind of what this final effect is looking like here. Um, so at the end, I know that was a lot to cover, and definitely not everything was uh, able to be covered um, with all those uh, pipelines being set up here. But um, uh, yeah, Aaron, if you want to open up for the uh, Q and A or um, any further discussion, or to go back to certain parts of the uh, demo that I was showing here, I'd be more than happy to do it, just to show uh, or go into more detail of any of what I was demonstrating here. Yeah, sure. Now, firstly, Tyler, thanks for that. That was uh, super informative and I think a great showcase of A, the course itself and just what Unreal can do. Um, but yeah, guys, if you do have any questions that you want to ask just before we wrap up, please post them up now and Tyler will definitely answer them. Um, but I have a few questions from my end, Tyler. Um, sure. Like, with these effects, obviously, you talked about the difference in doing it in Cascade and Niagara. And like you mentioned, that ultimately it could be done in either one. I guess it all depends on visual style and what your intention is, for example. Like you mentioned, I think a portfolio piece is a great example because ultimately, um, with a portfolio, if it catches the eye of whoever's looking, that's ultimately what that matters. Um, but say with these effects, for example, that you've made and built up, um, from someone who is very unfamiliar with Unreal Engine and real-time art, how easy is this to package and kind of populate a scene with obviously we've seen you with your personal work and the stuff on the course um how you can populate almost you know an entire environment um but is that easy to do like say for someone who's used to like kit bashing and photo bashing um is it as easy as that oh most definitely yeah these um particle effects i mean i can let me go ahead and demo that for you right now like uh let me see let me uh do the last bit here which is grabbing that um go ahead and T for translucent. Yeah, this is um, extremely easy to populate. And if I just wanted to say, like, um, hypothetically do this where I scale it down and um, sort of shrink it like that, I mean, this, whoop, let me bring that back there. Uh, but yeah, the um, kit bashing factor with these uh, particle effects is extremely easy. Um, it's a really, really cool um, effect there. Let me see, there's a little bit of Z fighting going on there. Oh, I think I know what the problem is. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is uh, because these are translucent materials, um, you just need to keep uh, track and make sure that um, the sort order. So um, because it's using pixel depth, um, so if I want to have all these clouds kind of overlapping each other and you saw that little bit of like where it was popping in and out, that's because the engine is struggling. Like, I don't know which is in front of which you're going to have to tell me. And so if you select the mesh here and you um, type in sort and you go translucency sort order priority, um, this one I want to always be in front of all these other meshes because it's overlapping. So I'm just putting this at a value of one. 
Fault bottom one is zero. So all these other uh, clouds here are at a uh, value of zero. So, uh, and if you need to have something in front of this hypothetically, so you can see again, we have this sort of like strange um, Z fighting going on. If I set this to two, you can see now that, um, well, let me see here. Might be because I have them both. Uh, let's see. And it might be the tessellation too that's doing this. If I do this, um, uh, this can also work in UE4 too. If I um, have this set at a uh, uh, world position offset, you won't run into that uh, sort of strobing problem with the uh, tessellation there. But um, to answer your question, yeah, um, the sort of set dressing or kit bashing of creating your scene, I mean, that is definitely um, a very, very easy and quick thing that I can do here because, yeah, what's really nice, especially with uh, Niagara, I want to demonstrate this really quick too, just because it's so cool, is that if I go into this Niagara system, um, if I want to say, let's see here, if I do something like linear color, uh, I'm doing a user parameter, which is like a, a parameter that you see in a material instance. Uh, so I'm just going to say color. And so if I set this default color at something like red, and I'm just going to do this for the uh, swirling balls here. Um, so I'm going to go over here to the swirling balls for the initialized particle for this color right here. I'm going to uh, type in color. And then I have this uh, user color that I set up right there. And if I go ahead and compile this, it'll repopulate here. You can see those balls are now red. But if I duplicate this, I'm going to uh, go out of the uh, sort here. You can see now um, I have this color tab set up here. So it was like, hey, I want to uh, duplicate this and I want to change up this color. I, all I need to do is just do that, switch around the color, and now these balls are blue again. So uh, you have where you don't have to duplicate a whole Niagara particle, which is really, really nice. Uh, you're just like, hey, I just want to change one small parameter of this. And you just make your one particle. And it's like, hey, if I just want different colors, if I want red flames or green flames or anything like that, um, you just make this parameter and you just uh, switch up these colors. And um, it's that easy. It's a really, really powerful factor that Niagara has, which is really cool. Nice. Um, and I'm not sure if I answered this earlier, um, but earlier on in the chat, um, Alan asked... Do you need any basic knowledge of the engine? Now, before you answer that, I just want to add my two cents on there. Um, so when, obviously, before the course launch, I got, I got a chance to have a look at it. The way Tyler explains everything, and this is someone who's, again, completely not familiar with this space, like, I would say I'm a complete beginner, and I managed to find a way to follow it, at least understand what the principles were. Um, so that's someone saying it not from Tyler's angle, but yeah, Tyler, if you want to give a, a proper answer to that, um, over to you. Yeah, I would say um, a basic understanding of UE4, the material layout, and the um, sort of mesh and texture pipeline um, is extremely easy to learn and obtain uh, these days. And uh, the the links, or sorry, the video resources that Epic provides, the documentation Epic provides, um, I would say it's a very short, easy course of uh, learning where it's like it would probably take a couple days or a few days of like um, getting the basic terminology. And um, then going into this course of like, uh, what, what is nice about this course is I do break down uh, all the elements of uh, particles and how they work in real time. So it's like, okay, this is what uh, velocity is. This is what, you know, vector factors are doing. Um, this is what X, Y, and Z space is. Um, this is what a particle's lifetime is and what's going on. So we do extensively cover, um, if you've never touched uh, FX before, um, it's covered um, nice and uh, extensively in this course. Um, so the basic terminology of just like, you know, uh, the UE4 material pipeline, texture pipeline and mesh pipeline and everything like that. Um, it is technically not covered in this course, but luckily it's very easy to obtain. As Aaron was saying, it's, it's very easy to pick up and play, uh, pick up and learn, I should say. And a question from Chris, um, he asks, are there any volumetric effects in the course? So um, if you're talking about what you're seeing on screen here, um, with this demo, it's using a lot of the same stuff that I applied to the waterfall panner material um, and is then being covered uh, here in this uh, live stream. As far as volumetric, like um, the volumetric fog uh, work, um, unfortunately, uh, I did not touch too much on uh, taking volumetric voxel based um, uh, those those base effects and uh, covering that. Um, 
there are a couple good tutorials on that. And um, as far as honestly, from what I've seen when I do my personal work, um, I've tried with volumetric uh, cloud work and it is very cool when it works. But when I've been setting up my scenes and everything, it's like trying to get them to work versus like just taking a plane and panning tessellated or worlds of space cloud textures over it. Um, it always just seems to look a little better in my opinion. Uh, same with um, like uh, POM uh, cloud effects and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, while it's not covered, I'd say um, with uh, this kind of pipeline that I have here, honestly, it's a little bit more flexible and way more streamlined for me uh, just because I know exactly what the shape's going to be. I know exactly how the shapes are going to move. Um, and as time goes on, I think it'll be a lot easier to sort of wrangle what the volumetric um, voxel cloud shapes are doing. And I've seen some amazing stuff that artists can do with them, uh, without a doubt, for like Fortnite and stuff like that. But um, as of now, this would probably be the um, pipeline that uh, I like to use when I'm creating like my volumetric cloud stuff. And I believe with the scenes that are included in the lesson files for the course, um, the clouds that you include are already in that file, right? Uh, they will be, yeah. I need to um, package this. I will um, start as soon as we're done with this uh, stream. But yeah, we'll definitely make sure that this uh, content content is included. Cool. So if there's any more questions, please send them through. Otherwise, I think we can start to wrap this up. Um, but before we do, um, I want to announce the winners of our giveaway. So three lucky winners who um, basically entered on our social media platforms and we'll be getting the course for free. So we'll be in touch. But before I announce that, um, so VFX and Unreal, which is Tyler's new course for Learn Squared, is available right now. It's currently on a 40% discount um, and that ends on February the 28th. So Monday, I believe um so yeah if you are looking to get it this is a great time to get it because um you obviously want to get it cheaper before it goes up in full price but if you want to check out the course so obviously tyler's given you a great example of what you can expect in the course um but this is a very small snapshot compared to the, the wide array that tyler has offered in the course all of our first lessons are free including this one so all you got to do if you haven't got an account already with us just sign up and you can check out the first lesson i believe the first lesson aside from um background into the um course you will be making an effect in there and i believe it's the fire lesson so you're making flames and how tyler builds that so definitely check that out just to give yourself um a look at the course and what it can do for you um and if you want to just hear more about tyler uh, and about his journey and more of his opinions on this particular space and obviously his career path so far um we do have two podcast episodes with him um so if you're not familiar with our podcast it's the learn squared podcast um, it's on our YouTube channel as well, so you can just tap that and click on our channel videos and you can see them also, um, because Tyler does go into depth on a lot of things, um, aside from real-time art. Um, and yeah, just final question, Tyler, are you active on Discord? Uh, I am. I need to be more active. I, I do have a uh, account and um, uh, yes, I am. Uh, I know I'm uh, on Learn Squares Discord and um, I need to... Uh, so yes, I let me see if I can find my name if anyone wants to contact me really quick and yet if you are um on our um discord channel um you will be able to on our unreal channel um yeah. just put questions in there and tyler will see that and obviously um if you get to it he will 100 percent answer that as well gotcha yeah i, I might uh, yeah with the discord uh, channel i will uh uh yeah just not to slow down the stream i might put the discord details in my uh like art station details or something like that um, I'll quickly announce the winners for um, the challenge in the meantime. Um, so um, on the screen, you should be able to see uh, the three winners that can have access to the course. Um, so we have at Pete on repeat, um, we have Benjamin Trunch. Sorry, Benjamin, if I mispronounce your name. And Adhen1. Um, they are all the winners of VFX in Unreal. So we shall be in touch via your DMs um, to send you over access to the course so congratulations um and tyler if there's anything left from yourself uh, or any final words to students or people who tuned in thank you by the way for tuning in um yeah um feel free to drop that in and then we can uh, head off yeah i mean everyone that uh, uh decided to stop by thank you so much um really excited for uh people getting the course um uh, really excited to see what you create i'm i can't wait to see um just yeah thank you so much for uh uh yeah for letting me do this demo for you and show you some of the stuff i made and can't wait to see what you create 
Awesome. And yeah, um, if you do want to get in touch, obviously, like Tyler mentioned, if it's course related to um, Tyler's course, please hit us up on Discord and um, he's going to put it on his art station profile so you can get in touch with him directly on Discord. Um, but also feel free to just message us on our Discord, through IG, um, whichever is easier for yourselves. Obviously, through our website as well, support at lensquare.com. We'll be more than happy to get back in touch. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Again, remember VFX in Unreal is available right now. Sign up to learn for free for the first lesson or sign up before February 28th to get it 40% off. Thank you everyone for jumping on um, and we'll see you guys again soon.